you're a CSS expert. It's not necessarily to point that out again. But why did you choose to focus on CSS? Um, things just kind of happened that way. I started teaching myself how to build websites when I was 15 to 17. And it's just, that's what I ended up playing with the most and what I enjoyed doing the most. So then I just thought, well, why don't I just make my job all about it? Um, so that's, what it's, that's how it started off. But then as the web has got more complex over the last five years, it's become an area that you, you really can specialize in. And because I enjoy it so much, I've just decided never to stray elsewhere, which may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing, but it's currently the, the, the field I enjoy the most. So one of the questions that people asked to ask you was, since there are a lot of buzzwords in front of that, like, A lot. And the newcomers can just get lost. Yeah. So what are the steps to take in order you know, to get into the right direction, at least for the beginners? Um, Keep everything as simple as it needs to be. I mean, beginners and experts alike have a real tendency to just to use things because they exist. And there's a lot of value in just keeping things simple. Um, you can often feel, especially as a beginner, you can often feel like there are a million and one things you don't know about or a million and one things you need to learn. But the truth is, you only learn it when you need it. I mean, you can learn it if you're interested, but it's really, really counterproductive to learn things you don't need and try and use them when you shouldn't. So my advice to professionals and beginners alike is leave things alone until you know you need them. Uh, if you want to learn out of interest, then you know, go for it and learn whatever you want. But um, certainly for beginners, you know, you'll read about all these tools that people need, all these tools that people use, um, but you'll often find that you don't need them until a really obvious use case comes around. So I tell people not to panic, not to try and use everything just because they feel they need to, and, uh, and take it at their own pace. It can be really overwhelming, like especially like you say, the amount of buzzwords around it can be really overwhelming, but keeping things simple is probably the, the safest bet. What are the sources or the people you follow in order to stay in touch with what's going on? I mean, you're one of the trendsetters, but you know, who are the people that you look up to? Um, currently, right now, there are people like uh, Nicholas Gallagher. He's a guy who works for Twitter, uh, does some amazing work. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Paul Lewis, works for Google, and he's, his job is all about making the internet really fast. And he's a genius. Uh, so there are people out there all the time making like, fantastic advancements. Uh, Nicole Sullivan is a, um, a woman from uh, the US, and she did some amazing, really, really clever work about four years ago, maybe even longer than that. Um, so in, in my line of work, those are sort of core people that, that I look to. But there are people coming up all the time. Uh, there's a young guy called uh, Hugo from France, and he's real young, and he's, you know, he's carving his path. Um, so it's really hard to just name a few people. You know, everyone in this industry is making incredible stuff all the time. And it, it does feel overwhelming trying to keep an eye on, on who's doing what. Now that you mentioned Fast Web, I, I couldn't help but thinking about Internet Explorer. And so what do you think about support for um, eight and nine versions? Um, it all boils down to, to the business. So I used to work for a really large company in, in England called Sky. Uh, Sky do a lot of TV stuff. And um, we had to support a lot of old versions of Internet Explorer, but when we actually went back and looked at how many people use IE, um, and we're talking about like versions like 7 and 8, they, they brought no money in for us. They, weren't, they cost more to look after than they actually spent with us. So, I mean, if your business says that, look, 90% of our income is from IE 8 users, then, yeah, you're going to have to support IE 8. But if you can make a really good business case for not supporting browsers, you know, it all boils down to numbers, really, and money, and you know, how much does it cost to support versus how much do they spend with you. Um, you can make really pragmatic business decisions. But there are a lot of companies out there who work in um, like banking, for example, and all of their users are on IE, like locked down machines. And that's just, I mean, it sucks, but you've got to do it. But I'm really lucky that I don't, I don't have to do it anymore. It's so nice. So it, this is the world, of, at least for now, of full stack developers. Mm. How do you feel about those who are like yourself specialized for CSS, HTML? You know, how, how, what should employees do in order to explain to their employers and you know, the business environment they work in that HTML and CSS is a full-time job? The honest answer is that it's really difficult. Um, I decided to work for myself about a year ago, and that's because it's hard to get 
a full-time job just knowing CSS, unless you work for a really rich company, someone like you know, Facebook or Google. People need full-stack developers. People need someone who can do a bit of everything. My advice to someone who just wants to focus on you know, only knowing JavaScript or only knowing CSS would be to look at you know, more freelance or consultancy type roles where a company doesn't have to employ you for years at a time. You can work for people in short stints. They need your expertise, but not full time. Um, it is really difficult to get full time work as someone who specializes so much. Um, so that's why I went down the consultancy avenue. I work with clients for a day or two at a time, um, do workshops and training kind of things. Um, because, you know, someone who's very specialized is useful like that. But yeah, I would recommend if you want to be very employable, try and spread your wings and try and be a full stack developer. If you want to be really specialized, market yourself in such a way that you can do short amounts of very specialized work for, for different people. That's probably the advice I'd give. Well, you're pretty young and you're already a consultant, a very respected one. You know, how do older ones or those who are more experienced look at it? Um, how do they look at me? Yep. Um, it's really interesting. I try and not tell clients how old I am. Um, luckily, I, I look quite old. So look, most people think I'm, you know, as, you know, in my 40s or whatever. Uh, I look a lot older than I am. So most people don't notice. But when a client asks, how old are you? It always really surprises them. And I don't think I have a problem with ageism. I don't think people, you know, judge me because of my age. But you can tell that people's perceptions do change. When they learn that I'm 24, they're like, oh, all right. How come you're coming in and teaching us what to do? So I just, I just try and avoid the subject if I can. I don't, I've never experienced ageism, and I've never experienced anyone holding me back because of my age. Um, but it is just one of those things where you've, it becomes really awkward trying to explain to a client how on earth you can charge them money to tell people twice as old as you how to do their jobs. Well, I guess you're just lucky to be in the area where that doesn't matter, where age doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine for a lot of people it would matter. I can imagine for a lot of cultures that would be a difficult thing to come up against. Um, but you know, I just remain professional. I, I don't care how old my client is. Um, you know, and, and typically clients don't care how old I am. As long as I can do the work they need or advise them in the way they want, uh, everyone's left happy. But it is something I try and avoid mentioning. Should designers code and developers design? Or should they work together and try to you know, just build a more efficient relationship? The last one, and you've put it perfectly, build a more efficient relationship. Um, it's really difficult to tell every designer in the, in the world you have to code, because what if they don't want to? Like, what if they don't want to do any coding? That's fine. But as long as they can work effectively with a developer. One thing I've always said is we've got this problem where you've got a team of designers and a team of developers, and even though they work for the same company and they're on the same team, there's kind of like a war between them. Like, there's always like you know, fighting between them and, and bickering and arguing. And I think, well, that's, that's a problem. Like, you shouldn't have these two different groups of people. You should have one big, I call it the user interface team. Like, if you build something that a user sees, it doesn't matter if you're a designer or a developer. The key is working effectively and efficiently together to both just do really good work. Um, I think it really helps if designers have a knowledge of how code works. And if they can code a little bit, then that's good. Um, but if they don't want to, then you, know, you can't tell you can't tell everyone that designers have to code. And another thing, it's really interesting that you mentioned should developers design. No one ever tells developers they need to learn design theory, and I find that really interesting. It's always, should designers code? And I'm like, well, developers should design. Like, should, they should understand color theory or type, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I do feel like a lot of people put pressure on designers. And it could be a lot easier. You know, you get someone who's a brilliant designer who is open to being challenged or open to collaborating more. And that's when you do the best work. The best work is when two people, two or more people, all just work together to do good stuff. The next question is kind of related to something you already said, but what about the trends and the noise? You know, when you hear about something and that's trending at a time, how do you know if it's really quality stuff or it's something that you should not pay too much attention to? That's a really, I think, I think trends in design and development are a lot like fashion. You know, you know, when you look at pictures of yourself from the 90s and it's like, oh, why was I wearing that? But it seemed so cool at the time. And the same thing is going to happen with the web. It's bound to happen. We do things and we'll think, who thought that was a good idea? You know, um, DHTML, for example, like really cruddy, horrible, nasty, um, old school ways of making web pages work. 
Um, they, were, they were really popular within 10 years ago, right? But now everyone sort of laughs at that. And I think it's really important that you need to see, you need to be able to not guess. I think you should approach everything with a lot of caution. Just because everyone's using it doesn't mean it's good. I mean, everyone, everyone eats at McDonald's doesn't mean McDonald's is good. So popularity and quality are not the same thing at all. And I think every designer, developer needs to just keep that in mind. You know, if someone's tweeting about, oh, look at this new task runner. It's like, right, well, we've got a task runner that already works. Um, do we need another one? I'll be cautious of it. I'll try it and I'll give it a, an objective, like a um, test, if you like. But I think it boils down to, like I said, uh, like the first question, keeping things simple. You know, if you don't think you need it, even if it's a trend, even if everyone's talking about it, if you don't need it, don't try and use it. But yeah, there are so many trends in our industry. And it's such a young industry that we haven't seen anything come full circle really yet. We're too young to be able to have that wisdom and that, that hindsight. It will happen, I'm sure it will happen. And where do you see web business or development in the next five years? Um, wow, that's a huge question. Um, it's so difficult to say. I think there's a big trend towards, ironically, uh, offline. So there's a lot of work being done at the moment with, right, we've got these brilliant web apps. So we've taken uh, Microsoft Word and put it into Google Docs. But now you need um, an internet connection to use Google Docs. So a lot of people, um, people like Jake Archibald at Google, are doing a lot of really great work with offline stuff. So I think taking things to the cloud, but then making them work not on the cloud, I think maybe offline. Um, but as for a full five-year landscape, I honestly couldn't tell you. That's exciting. It is, it is cool. One question was, where do you get ideas and motivation? Um, I never stop thinking. And that's not in a pretentious kind of way. I just, I can't, I can't seem to shut off. I will be walking down the street to go and buy some groceries and I'll have an idea and it's like, oh, that'll be good. And while I'm shopping, I'll be picking things up, but all I'll be thinking about is the idea and I'll get home and I'll put the things in the fridge and I'll, I'll get to work. Just by not stopping thinking, I don't try and have ideas and I don't go like sit and smoke a pipe to try and get ideas. If you're just interested in what you do, I mean, I'm sure you'll have it all the time with certain things. You'll have an idea for, oh, that'd be cool just having ideas and then, then tinkering with them. Um, I think there's a lot of value in spending time away from the computer. Most of my ideas happen when I'm in the shower or when I'm out, I do a lot of hiking. So when I'm out in the hills and I can't get any signal on my mobile, like I'm completely shut off from technology, I'll be like, oh, this would be cool. But then I just desperately want to get off the hill and find a computer, which is quite bad. But yeah, um, it sounds really cliche, but spending time away from technology can give you really good ideas for things to do. Now beer time. Beer time. Open both of them and try them and say which one you like better. I haven't, I haven't tried a uh, Serbian beer yet. Tried some Serbian wine earlier on and that was nice. Although, can someone tell me a little bit about these two beers? Uh, well, somebody in the group, in a Facebook group, asked what beer he would like better, love or yellow. So we had to test them. Let's have a look. <laughs> so the, the yellow is older. Say again, sorry? sorry? What was that, sorry? It's more innovative. Right. Just try it. That tastes familiar. That tastes like, um, tastes like a beer we've got in England. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> I was also reliably informed that these aren't necessarily the best beers in yeah. Serbia. Wow. In fact, Got to do this properly. Cleanse my palate. That's interesting. They're quite different. It doesn't help that they're a little bit warm. I think I'll have to have birth that's and decide. How, that's how bread gets from. <laughs> um, I think the lab's probably got a little more flavor to it. Um, you could probably drink more of this because it doesn't seem as, as strong, but I think I probably prefer the lab. It's got a little bit more flavor. Good, thank you. Is that a good answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.